And where can we find our podcast? Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should just have a recording of this. <laughs> and you're just going to be pissed. Um, <laughs> I felt like that was a really nice place to end. Yeah, yeah, and, and your next guest is here. So. We'll cut that out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I hope he's going to cut a bunch of yeah. this out. All my, all my stammering and Don't my worry, digressions. Don't worry, I ask questions anyway. <laughs> and me, like, messages to anyone. Hello and welcome to Word Up Podcast. I'm Evie. And I'm Webster. And today we're here with Janice. Hi, Janice. Hi. I'm thrilled to be here. Wow. <laughs> How are you today? Um, great. Great. Uh, oh, God. I have nothing to say. <laughs> How am I today? <laughs> Are we recording this? Is this actually being recorded? I should have I should have prepared a much better answer. Um, <laughs> just uh, how are you? I'm great. <laughs> I just uh, I just got the French cover for my second children's book, and it's a thing of beauty, and I'm really excited about it. Oh, congratulations! Thank you. What does that mean? You got the French cover. Um, uh, the book was picked up by a French publisher and translated right. into French, uh, um, which hasn't happened for me yet. It's my fifth book, right. but uh, I've been in Australia, in England, um, but never in France before. Ah. So now one of my books is in France. Wow. Exciting. You're not going to use any of this, right? This is all going to be... Oh, this is all great. <laughs> I am the most uncomfortable person in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, oh, you don't have to notice him. I don't. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so tell us more about you and what brought you to be in all these countries with all your five books. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I am a native New Yorker and I spent the first 50 years of my life in New York before coming to Amsterdam this September. Um, and I was writing from a very young age, always knew I wanted to be a writer, um, wrote throughout grade school, throughout high school. Um, had a little bit of a crisis of confidence and decided, I don't know what to do in college. Should I try and be a writer or should I, you know, invest in something that makes money? So I went to business school for six months oh. <laughs> and then I uh, went back to school for literature. And um, I, uh, you know, New York uh, is a very active cultural scene. So... From a young age, it was easy for me to find people to collaborate with, and it was e easy for me to find places to showcase my work. Mm -hmm. um, when I was 20, I started contributing to uh, an alternative newspaper called New York Press. Um, I started going to uh, the New Yorican Poets Cafe, which was in the East Village, is in the East Village in New York, um, and meeting people that way. So um, I got to be part of a big creative community that um, nurtured me and taught me mm. and helped me sort of launch my career. Wow. What yeah. Story. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For me, um, writing was always something that I discovered <clears throat> much later in my life, yeah. uh, writing for myself anyway, as opposed to, you know, being told to write at school. Um, was it something that you did at home early on or yes. how, how did that come so, along? So I, 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 this is not actually my first book. My first book is called Janice and the Giraffe and I wrote it when I was four and I also illustrated it. Wow. And the giraffe is like disturbingly phallic. Um, <laughs> not that four-year-olds are great at drawing giraffes anyway, but it really looks like I went to the zoo to visit a dick. Um, anyway, that was my first, that was my first book. And I, you know, I stapled it together and it was like, it, you know, I was really proud of it. And um, so, yes, I was always making little books and writing stories. And um, I did little plays with myself uh, by using a tape recorder. I would record oh, lines yeah. and then record other lines. This is, I was a very... Um, uh, unpopular child. <laughs> I spent a lot of time by myself mm. and um, it's sort of perfect uh, perfect conditions for growing a writer is um, 
an anxious kid with too much time on their hands and uh, a, a need to try and make connections. Mm. So, yeah, I started very young, um, kept going. Um, New York and, and, and New York Press was sort of like, that's when my career, and I'm, I'm doing air quotes, so I hope they're <laughs> audible, audible air quotes, <laughs> my <laughs> career um, sort of began there because once you have publication credits, once you have performing credits, then you get more. It's like work begets work. Mm. Um when I would get invited to do a poetry reading, people would see me and they would say, hey, come do my poetry reading or come do this. Um, in 92, I was cast in a performance poetry group called the Pussy Poets. <laughs> uh, this is pre-vagina monologues, so this was, this was kind of hot, hot stuff. Um, it wasn't our idea, a guy who hung around New York and Poets Cafe was like, oh, I have a great idea because he was South African. <laughs> and um, he had a great idea and we were going to be this poetry group. And he just cast us. It's like he just he just reached out and grabbed the nearest five girls. There was oh. no <laughs> – and stuck us together. But immediately, because of the name, we started to take off. So then we were in this very bizarro position of having a big platform but not being very good. Mm. Right. And that pushed you to be good? <laughs> or to be it, put, it pushed us to get better. It pushed us into um, a lot of fights and creative disagreements mm. until I left the group diva <laughs> that I am to become a solo act. Um, ah, that's yeah. the story goes. Beyonce. Right? <laughs> well, I mean. Justin Timberlake. <laughs> you know. Um, so as a solo act, I was still coasting off. The Pussy Poets. I got to do Lollapalooza in 94. I got to do Woodstock 94. Wow. And appear at all these places. I was on MTV um, talking about my ex. Uh, poetry was really hot in the early 90s, and I was there. So <laughs> it, that, that completely just sort of just kept that ball rolling. Then I started writing for Bust Magazine, which was new, um, a feminist magazine in the States. Um, and through that visibility, I got other writing gigs and, you know, it just sort of built on itself until my early thirties when I finally wrote my book, you know, the book mm -hmm. that I had been waiting to write all of my life. I finally was able to sit down and write it. And, um, Girl Bomb is the title. It rhymes with my last name, Earl Baum. <laughs> and, um... I had been I had been writing and performing under that name as a slam poet. Girl bomb is mm -hmm. you know right. kind of catchy, easy to remember. Um, so this came out uh, in two thousand six. Um, I published another memoir two years later, uh, then a novel, and then I started writing for tweens out of nowhere because I have no kids and. My early stuff was all very, very, very sexually explicit. Mm. Right. <laughs> so I don't know how I wound up writing for tweens, but it was just kind of a fluke. Um, wow. Yeah, that's 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 the. Oh wait, I left I left shit out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Uh, the performing scene in the East Village of New York wasn't just limited to slam poetry. Yeah. So. Um, slam poetry was very, very hot, but then it sort of started to cool off. And, um, you know, I had displayed my dysfunctional behavior all over town, and I had kind of burned that scene for myself, you know, like I had slept with everybody, argued with everybody, and it was just like time for me to find a new place <laughs> to put myself. Um, so I started doing comedy um, at a different club, at a, a place called Surf Reality. And uh, that's one of the reasons when I came to Amsterdam, the first thing I did was look for open mics. And that's how I found Word Up. Because the open mic scene that I was a part of was such a fundamental uh, piece of my development and um, sort of a... a, a my, my glory days were not being on MTV and being in Lollapalooza. My glory days were being in this shitty theater on the Lower East Side at an open mic 
because the community that sprang up around it, the collaboration, the um, intensity of the emotional relationships um, had forged my deepest friendships that still, you know, 20 years later mm-hmm. are, are the people who are closest to me. Um, so I have kind of a very, very idealized um, notion of what an open mic can be and what it can do. And I've seen the word up, open mic, and I think it does wonders. Mm. Last time I was there, there were, there were some kids behind me who were very nervous about reading their poems. <laughs> um, they were about gender identity, and... Uh, I was so excited for them. I was so excited for them (laughs) that they were going to read out loud and they were encouraging each other. And it's like, um, that to me is uh, creative magic. Um, You also said that uh, it was for you about connections and finding connections because you said you were a lonely kid. Yes, yeah. So I'm just wondering, is it connections to more to yourself or to outside world or finding something that you might have lost? Um, you know, it, as, a, as a weirdo, uh, you want to find other weirdos. Mm. Um, because, <laughs> right, because even if your weird is different than their weird, like some they they they've experienced some of the same stuff that you have and so um an open mic is a great place to find other weirdos uh and that means that um artistic communities sometimes harbor predators sometimes harbor people who are very mentally ill or very marginalized mm-hmm. for one reason or another um and yet that's that's the segment of the population that um, often gets left out. Not the predators, they're all over the place, but <laughs> marginalized people, people with mental illness, uh, people who are heavily addicted and have no other place to go can sometimes find, as I've seen, solace at an open mic. In the New York, in, um, in the early 90s, there was a homeless guy named Orion who would sort of walk in off the street, rambling, read his poems that were written on the back of a, you know, greasy paper bag. Mm. And um, he was part of, he was part of the thing. He was part of the scene. And as such, people looked out for him, interacted with him. I mean, I think part of the thing about being homeless is um, you don't get to talk to people. Mm. Nobody talks to you. And uh, boy, I'm really on a tangent here. <laughs> no, it's going great. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm like, tell me more. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> because I had to leave home at the age of 15, there was uh, a domestic violence in my mm. home and I had to leave. Um, I went straight to a shelter, so I never spent a night out outside. I was not sleeping rough, as they right. say. Um, uh, I always slept indoors. I always had food, but you still felt kind of homeless living of at a shelter. Um, and so that experience was really fundamental to shaping my personality after that. Um, as a loner, it made me feel even further away from people. Um, and so to be in a community that embraced people who smelled bad, people who had, um, bad teeth or not all of their teeth, uh, people who were, um, personally repellent in many ways, um, I had been repellent. Hmm. You know, I was a shoplifter. I sold drugs. I stole from people. So um, I kind of have to have empathy for the marginalized that continues to this day. Like when I was in New York, I would give people change because I'm I'm doing just fine now and nobody needs to worry about me. Um, <laughs> I could give away change in the subway. And um, somebody said, 
oh, you know, they're just going to spend it on drugs. And I was like, well, I smoke a lot of weed, so um, I'm not going to judge really what they spend it on. They asked me, can you spare some change? And the answer is yes, I can. And um, God, there were some times when smoking a joint just would have made all the difference in the world to me. Mm. 15, 16, 17 years old, a beer <laughs> would have come in so goddamn handy. So um, I also went back to volunteer at the shelter. Um, when I was trying to write Girl Bomb, it's like I had a lot of archives. I had a lot of the notes that my friends and I had passed. I mm. had a lot of my old journals and stuff. But um, going back to the actual physical place where I had lived and walking into the old rooms and smelling that particular cinder block, carpet, cement kind of smell um, really helped me to write this book, mm. Girl Bomb. Um, and what was the... What was was there a moment when you decided I really need to write this book? And if so, why did you feel the need to 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 put it into a physical form that people can engage with? Well, after after being part of the Pussy Poets and understanding the power of marketing, I kind of knew that oh, being homeless was the most interesting thing about me. Like I you really got to push the homeless angle. You know what I mean? Talk it up, <laughs> make it. I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious, but. Um, and I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't really a part of my poetry, but I did write about it uh, for New York Press. Um, and I knew it was, it was something that not only made me interesting to other people, but had changed my life fundamentally. Yeah. Um, so it was a story I had been trying to write for a long time and um, in different forms would get two or three chapters in and then would quit and then would blame myself for being a lazy asshole mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah. th th repeat. Uh, but... Um, uh, just for our audience listening, uh, would you be able to describe it in uh, a quick and easy way yes. what the book is about? Maybe <laughs> yes. we put okay, that so at the front. <laughs> it's, called, it's called The Girl Bomb, A Halfway Homeless Memoir, and it is the true story of um, the time I spent living in shelters and group homes in New York City in the 1980s. Um, and uh, this book led directly to the next book because – when I went back to volunteer at the shelter, I met uh, a young woman who was so fascinating that I became very involved in her life. Um, and my next book was about her. So it's kind of handy the way that <laughs> shakes down. Sweet. Um, and you talk about your experience um, moving away from your parents' house and uh, eventually moving into a shelter. Yeah. Can you tell us what that was like <laughs> um, in detail? What was the, uh, what, was the what, what drove you to, to get to that? Because uh, it I seems think it like was a massive a, change. Yeah, it was a real, it was a real like split second decision. Right. It was really, and I must have, I must have been thinking about it because I did know where to go, which was Covenant House, which is still the largest provider of beds for homeless teenagers in the United States. Um, but Covenant House at that time was one building in the middle of Times Square, which was a really seedy place to be. Um, so I knew it existed. So I must have been sort of paying attention somehow. Right. Um, but I walked out. And I hadn't been planning to. I didn't really pack anything. I didn't think it through. Um, and uh, that was a, a real turning point for me. Um, it was, you know, I, I grew up in New York City. And I went to public high school. And it's a very diverse place. And yet I had been living in a very white New York before I went to Covenant House. And then I was in the minority, hmm. um, and it was a really important experience, really important experience for me, um, and not always comfortable, 
but uh, really allowed me to see my privilege in action in such a profound way. The way that I was treated by the system was so very different from mm-hmm. the way the girls I lived with were treated. Um, and that was another reason why I wanted to go back to Covenant House was A, to sort of pay back what they had given me and B, to um, to bring this understanding that I had and put it to, put it to some kind of use. So... Um, and is it uh, that you leaving your home or your parents' home uh, and you performing, did it go hand in hand or did you take some time to... Well, you know, in, in a weird way, they they are kind of connected. Um, in high school, I was lucky enough to uh, be part of the theater club. Right. Um, and we had a teacher who could have cast the easygoing, popular kids in the shows, but instead he put me and uh, some of the other more marginalized kids in the shows, and it was all we had. It was all we had. I mean, who? after rehearsal, I wanted to stay and build the sets. I had no, I, I, there was no place better to go. Mm. I mean, this was the best that there was. So somebody you know, reached out, took a chance, took me in, made me part of something. And um, so I got to be in shows and people clapped and laughed. And that was a feeling that I wanted. It's a sense of belonging. To have again. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. In, in a bigger way, right? That's yeah. also you're part of something yeah. and, and people appreciate you. And it's it's feeling that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I also, what you were talking also about uh, your poetry club, it's like, I was thinking how much it's uh, art and poetry and culture in general really allows people to sort of hold on to that humanity, that uh, connection, yeah. the, the the feeling that you're part of something. Yeah, yeah. That's it. If, if, um, if you're lonely and you go out to do karaoke, um, you're singing with other people and it feels less lonely you're not necessarily having a conversation you're just kind of exchanging yeah. atoms <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you're just actually probably talking for the first time in that day or something yeah yeah perhaps perhaps <laughs> perhaps do you think uh given the experiences you had earlier on you would have written the books that you have or at least uh written books if if you hadn't uh walked out that early um You know, when I was young, I thought that writing was going to be the thing that saved me. I thought, I'm going to write a book, and it's going to make money, and that money will get me out of the house. That was, you know, a child's, a nine-year-old's logic. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to write a book, it's going to make money, and the money's going to get me out of the house. Um, so I always had the impetus to do it. I always really wanted to do it, um, and... I think that uh, it was a story that I had to get out one way or another. Um, so I'm glad I had spent all that time alone in my room, writing, journaling, making stuff up, drawing, um, living in that fantasy world. But to go back to the idea of the open mics and community, um, In 2002, some friends and I started a writing group. Um, we would meet every week. There were six of us. Three of us would workshop one week. The other three would mm -hmm. the other week. You got you had to email your pages by Friday night and blah, blah, blah. And we committed to each other to make a writing group. And that's how I was able to write the first draft of the book. I had been, I had been professionally writing. I had been paid to write, but I couldn't write a book. I just couldn't mm. get it out until I made a commitment to other people that we were all going to struggle through this together. So that's how I was able to do the first draft of the book was by coming together with other artists who had the same goals. So having, a, in a way, a mirror. Support. Or support. accountability. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And on that note, yeah, would you like to share something with us? Sure, sure. This is a poem called A Woman Now. This must be it, 
this is what you were taught to want, this, met him mouth open to kiss, and this, two iodine fingers, lynch brutal hangnails, tangle crisp hairs, and pinch your lips together. You moan, you don't wince. Pushed over and in, your whole clenching nails like a fist, the chafing burn to resist, his rabid quenching does not desist in the face of your mask. You can't deny, but you're not what you do, sucking to keep from drowning, dying for it or from it, a good lover to get it over, get it over. Just come, hurry up and come. Just come, hurry up and come. Shaking your whole body, no, no, notice me, notice that I don't want to do this, notice that I am dry under you, scraping with lout and lout again, slapping return carriage, pounding keys, remorse code signal, furied pleas, solace only with his impending release, and you continue to survive, cauterized gouges submitted inside, the surrender of his sudden naked eyes, widen your own perverse pride, because there's glory knowing how much you can take before you tear, and you think, you must be a woman now. You can bear anything. <laughs> Very vivid <laughs> poem. <laughs> thank you, thank you. This is this um, this that's from my old poetry days. That is from the early nineties. This was a this was a, a poem that I slammed with, you know, and people rated me on a scale of one to ten on on this poem. As, as well as others. Um, yeah, it was the birth of slam poetry, so anything that you could do to be like, I had the worst life, <laughs> you know, that, that would get the tens. Mm. Like, I had the worst life, I enjoy sex, how about you, and racism is bad. Those were the three poems that you could always get a ten. Got a plus. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, that's very limited. It, it was. It was very limited. Hopefully it's expanded a little bit since then. No, no, it hasn't expanded. Since then. <laughs> Somebody who knows is shaking, shaking their head. <laughs> and what was the uh, audience reactions when you would speak this song? Because it's quite, uh, um, quite it hard was, to uh, take in. Yeah, it was, it was potent. Um, and I would sometimes read it with another poem called The Slut of Pascack Valley High, which was about uh, another poem about promiscuity, um, but sort of having gotten a reputation. Um, you know, my, all, all my poems kind of had a narrative through line that mm. was, you know, like, um, yeah, a lot about, a lot about um, romantic relationships. Um, a lot about sex. I mean, we were the pussy poets, so we kind of had we kind of had to live up to that Makes somehow, sense. right? Yeah, and, you know. you're not going to do a poem about Aristotle. <laughs> no, although I did later in my life write a poem about Socrates. So you know, <laughs> there, there you go. go. Yeah, <laughs> I, I had sort of aged out of mm. the pussy poets by then. And I'm just wondering, like, how would you define yourself? Because you're visiting so many stages and you're a writer, you're a poet, slam poet. Right. Like, how do you, activist, I, I, I feel like also, how do you, do you have a, a certain way you like to introduce yourself? or? Um, I like to say I'm a writer and kind of leave it at that. Hmm. I mean, um, and the thing is that, that, like, writers don't need to go to open mics. There, there came a time in doing open mics where I started doing comedy and like stand-up comedy is such a high. It is such a rush. It is so, uh, such an amazing feeling in your body that I really started to think, oh, I want to become a comedian and started to, you know, make inroads and play around. But there came a time where I realized if you want to be a comedian, you have to be out six or seven nights a week doing comedy. And if you want to be a writer, you have to be home six or seven nights a week writing. And I had to choose. And I still loved getting up on stage and, and having people laugh and clap and it was immediate and you wrote something and that night it was out there rather than, you know, at home laboring for months and nobody ever sees anything. You know, it's mm -hmm. really, I, I, I missed that instant gratification, but I did really have to choose at that mm -hmm. point, what am I? Um, I'm not a poet. I'm not a slam poet. I don't do that anymore. Uh, I don't really perform anymore. I'm a writer and a writing coach. 
mm. is the other the <laughs> other thing that I like to call myself. Um, yeah, because you also have a YouTube channel for girls. Coach, yes, yeah. Well, no, boy, <laughs> boys and and the non-binary also very very welcome. Um, yeah, I started a, a series called Advice for Young Writers. Um, because again, I knew that I wanted to be a writer when I was eight years old, nine right. years old, and on. And there were no um, resources for me. Like, there was nothing that was sort of in terms that I could understand uh, about the craft or about the business that could have been helpful for me. So um, I wanted to pass on my wisdom in a series of 90-second to two-minute little sound clips and um yeah they found a little bit of an audience they're evergreen as uh we liked to say in the magazine industry and that you know they don't expire the advice the advice is good i hope St will still be good yeah do you think it's easier to be a writer today than it was back then given the all the information that people have access to there's blogs and websites right, and right. online courses dedicated to yes. anything you can find in the yes. world well what tr absolutely when it comes to publishing definitely um it's much easier to understand the business of writing now right it was very opaque um for a long time and that led to a kind of gatekeeping if you didn't know people who could tell you what to do, then you didn't know what to do and your your stuff never got anywhere. So, you know, again, um, publishing being kind of a, a very privileged world. Yeah. Um, where, they say it's, sorry, please yeah, go. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's it. Uh, I was going to say, they say it's, um, it's, it's not what you know, it's who you know, right? Yes, yes. And like a bad book is not going to get published because you know somebody but uh, a good book might go unpublished because you know nobody and nobody's giving you the advice that you need now again you can you can uh, look things up you should be able to find everything you need online but it's still it's a very very complex process of researching agents finding an agent writing a proposal you know getting that part done it's it's very labor intensive there's all kinds of little curly cues um, and you know, you just want to write. Right. <laughs> you don't want to have to sell it. You don't want to have to market it. But uh, it that that falls to the writer these days. So that's how it, that's how it's become harder. Interesting. Um, because there's so many more books, and nobody really cares <laughs> that much about any individual <laughs> right. book. Editors don't have time to edit. Publicists mm. can't publicize every single book, and. Um, so it gets it's 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 hard when you're at a large publisher to get attention and resources. Yeah, it's also become a, to me at least what I'm seeing. It's very fast food. Like the books that are published are not something that you necessarily want to keep for ten, twenty years. Right. Right. Yeah. It's really something that you just read and then you just exchange or right uh, hand down or whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> and maybe because of ebooks, maybe that is in part because of ebooks that it feels like less of a commitment that you've made mm. to a text, you know, it's just sort of like, it's this flimsy thing that will disappear eventually. Um, just such a shame in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's weird is that it, it seems like fast food and yet the process takes so long. If you sell a, a finished manuscript the soonest you will see a book is a year and a half, and often two years. It wow. takes two years for your actual physical book to wind up in the stores, which is forever. That's a very long time. <laughs> yeah, and and like some things, if if they rush things out, they can they can do that, but they don't do that unless it's a news thing. You know, it's very timely. It takes so long, so. Now writing for tweens, the challenge is they're all uh, very technically connected. They, um, they they use this software, they use that software, and mm. I'm trying to keep up to date with it. And it doesn't matter because by the time the book comes out, it's going to be outdated anyway. So, 
no instant gratification. <laughs> <laughs> so what would be your advice for people who are thinking of writing a book or just writing in general? Like what's your what's the the best advice you can the best uh, advice, offer? The best advice I can offer is something is better than nothing. <laughs> writing for five minutes is better than not writing for five minutes. That um You don't start writing a book by writing the first sentence and then the second sentence and then the third sentence. Mm. You don't paint a picture by starting in the top left corner <laughs> and painting it down. So uh, those are those are my two fundamental principles. Are are something is better than nothing, and um, start anywhere. Start anywhere. Mm. Start in the middle. Start with the parts that you want to write the most. If you like battle scenes, skip to the battle scenes. If you <laughs> like sex scenes, skip to the sex scenes mm -hmm. and get the momentum going that way. So it's exercising the muscle. And yes, just... exactly. And trusting <laughs> in the process. Yeah. Well. yeah. Wow. Well, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. I love being part of Word Up. I love being part of the podcast team. Um, I'm, I'm so grateful to have met like-minded people. Thank you. And for our audience listening, where can we find you? Uh, where, they can where can they find Girl Bomb and where can they find your social media and all that sort of stuff? Okay, I um, have sworn off social media, but I have a website at girlbomb.com, G-I-R-L-B-O-M-B, um, or janicerlbaum.com. And um, I love getting mail from readers so please uh, feel free to contact me nice thank you brilliant thank you and for our audience listening uh, you know where to find us at www.wordappodcast.com where you'll find past episodes with all our guests as well as information that we talked about in the podcast thank you thank you and goodbye bye Doi. <laughs> <laughs>